everybody. Welcome to the Relate with Nate tour. First time we're going on the road. We're headed out. Uh, we're promoting the Challenge for Change movement. Uh, we'll tell you a little bit more about that later. But we're going to visit some friends in Huntington and Ashland today. So stay tuned with us. We're going to learn some interesting stuff and have a little fun. West Virginia, uh, one of our first stops on our multi-city tour, and we're here at the um, Cabell County Board of Education. We have uh, Mr. William Smith, who is the superintendent of schools in Cabell County. Um, we want to welcome him to the show. Appreciate you Thank giving you. us some time, sir. You're welcome. So uh, on our on this trip we're going on, this tour, is we're stopping in different cities and we're talking about you know opioid abuse and substance abuse and uh, how it's affected maybe some some youth or how it's affected schools. Can you tell us anything about that? Well, you know, of course, that's been kind of brewing for some years. And what we found, um, and if you would take a poll, we brought our, how, all of our high school students into an auditorium and asked them to raise their hand if they either know someone who is addicted to drugs or it's in their family, you would almost have 100% would, would be able to tell you that. That wasn't like that, I think, 10 or so years ago but we start kind of, we can see that drifting. And it's caused a lot of issues. First of all, we have kids who come to our campuses every morning who are traumatized by either a police presence the night before or parents who have uh, overdosed or the use of drugs in the household, domestic kind of violence is, is re related to the opioid uh, epidemic. And now we're talking about how do we handle that? Our traditional um, uh, discipline uh, ways we do things are not most appropriate for traumatized kids. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing it from, from pre-kindergarten all the way through high school. All right, in Mingo County, we have this thing called Handle With Care that, that handles kind of what you were talking about. Right. Do y'all have that in this area too? Yes, we do. In fact, uh, the, most, the best participant is the Huntington Police. <clears throat> and uh, what they do with that program, of course, they call the school and let them know there's a child that, may, that had dealt, they have dealt with the night before and he needs to be handled with care. And that, to me, has been very effective. The, mo the most difficult part of it, of course, is when the individual officer has to do it. It sometimes doesn't get done. So the Huntington Police put something in place where the dispatcher takes care of that. Oh. So we get an email or whatever. It's pretty consistent. The others, uh, for example, Milton Police Department and the Sheriff's Department, uh, have difficulty because the individual officer just depends on whether they have time to do it. Yeah. Uh, so we're trying to work with them to get at that to happen. It does make a big difference. Uh, it helps when the child comes to school and we know to deal with that in a different manner. All right. Um, is there been any instances where uh, or something that happened that made you realize that there is a problem like not only in the town but in the school systems and in teenagers? Uh, we had 12 years ago, when I became superintendent in 2005, during prom night at Huntington High School, four teenagers were murdered, and uh, there was some drug issues involved there. We think that two of, two of them were prom attendees who left the campus or left the prom to go, I guess, score is what we think might have happened. Uh, they just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time, about 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning and there was a, uh, a killing that was, we know was drug related. They just happened to be there at the wrong time. That kind of uh, woke me up. That was something as a superintendent I didn't think I'd ever have to deal with. Mm -hmm. But the multiple murders and then dealing with the families and, the, and of course the community had grown up out of that. What we do today, which they call it a uh, day of hope. They celebrate every, every year, not celebrate, but recognize every year. And this church had purchased the property and uses it for drug rehabilitation issues. So we call that the day of hope. And I think that kind of got us started on track of how do we look at a, in our school system, how do we help our, our kids um, with this whole issue. That's tough because um, kids, I mean, people, especially with these opioids, you're, you're hooked before you even realize it. I know, right. I know people, a woman who was a, you know, a church woman, strong woman, and, and got hurt. And before she even knew it, she was, she was right. hooked. Right, right. You know? Because, you know, there's, I'm sure there's some physical that propensity to be, to be addictive. Mm -hmm. is, it plays a role in that as well. 
as you know, having the opioids and not monitoring how that's done. And it's people that would, would never do that, get hooked on that. You know? So it's not something that you're gonna rest your way out of. That, that lady that you talked about has no, pre, no business being in the prison system. We need to talk about how to re rehabilitate and get them off of the drugs. There's, wow. the, the treatment's more important. So uh, Huntington just got an award for uh, Nationwide. What was that award again? I think it was the friendliest city. The friendliest city. So we just don't want to talk about negative stuff. We also want to bring the positives and let people all across the world know that not only are there, I mean, this is not just a drug infested place, but also we have people who are working together and also the friendliest people in the country who are trying to, to better our communities. So don't just look down your nose at us. We're working yeah. hard and we're trying to make things better. Right. In fact, there was a $3 million grant. And so they're talking about what to do to have the most impact. And if you can see our downtown, is, it's uh, beginning to flourish. And some things yeah. are happening there. Our park system is, I think, uh, compared, to, compared to any park system. There are things for kids to do. There are playground equipment. They're remodeling. Uh, we have a great park system with Ritter and I think Rotary is another large one mm -hmm. uh, throughout the city. So, and then, of course, you see people that are exercising. The bike routes are opening up all over the city streets. And it's just a different Huntington. It's a different feel. Yes. People are starting to get that pride back. Yeah, there, pride. there you go. I think that makes a difference. Everybody feels like they're part of it. They're part of the crew and not just passengers here. All right. All right. Is there anything else you'd like to share with us? Um, well, you know, you, we were talking about traumatized kids. We've been doing some things with our teachers uh, training. We've had a person in that specializes, understands that, and talks about alternatives of how to deal with and how to recognize traumatized children. And they actually present like a child uh, with um, autism or uh, LD kind of traits. Mm -hmm. So that has us looking at how do we identify special needs kids as compared to those who are just traumatized and we need to do some other things with. It, it speaks to how you discipline, how you deal with them when they come to school, uh, how you make the day so that there's time for movement and, and different kinds of interaction that can help a, a child who's traumatized by, we talked about police presence in the right. home or just drugs in the home. All right. Well, that's good. My wife's a teacher, so, and she's, she's really good about with dealing with kids with learning disabilities and stuff mm -hmm. like that. So any kind of training she would would have a chance to take, I'm sure she'd like to yeah, jump in on that yeah. too. We're and you know we're not talking about just high school kids. We're talking about kids in pre kindergarten uh, and that type of thing. We're seeing behaviors that we've never seen before, where they're not able to. I think they call it um, uh, self regulate. You know when we get angry about something, you have a way of self regulating, so you mm -hmm. just don't fly off and whatever happens happens because you can't live in society and do that. But these kids don't have. Uh, ability to do that and so we have to teach them to self-regulate how do you talk yourself down how do you stop and listen you yeah. know, dealing with uh, rage and in, in your very young kids it's just phenomenal what you might see so we've uh, actually implemented an alternative kind of setting for some of our very young kids it's a three or four week program where they work with uh, school psychologists and and in counseling and then get them back in the regular classroom as quickly as we can Oh, that's with, great. With skills. So that's, uh, that's, that to me, I think that's where you're going to see a lot, a lot of things going, that the behaviors at the very young age are becoming much more volatile, so mm -hmm. to speak. All right. That's great. Well, guys, we want to thank uh, uh, William Smith for coming on the show, mm -hmm. um, okay. taking out the time out of his busy schedule to um, help start off our tour. And uh, do you have any last comments to say? No, I'm just glad that I think this is a great thing you're doing. Uh, you know, when you talked about the challenge for change and the choices the kids make, this is something even my wife who teaches kindergarten talks about good choices, things that we should never do. She says we should never lie, steat, and shield. She teaches kids about that. Mm -hmm. And then she also teaches about making better choices. What could you have done that would have made this better? And it's amazing they remember, because she's been teaching for several years, when they get up into the high school, they come back and thank her, thank her for that. Well, she probably is changing her thought process. Exactly. And keeping a lot of kids out of trouble. Exactly. That, that's why I think the critical piece is, is working with parenting. But in homes where they're dysfunctional, where you don't have that happening, mm -hmm. we've got to find a way. And it's not just the school system. It has to be the whole community of reaching those kids and teaching them how to do that. And I said, I've always said the faith-based community now can, needs to step up. Um, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, all those kind of uh, uh, 
organizations that work with kids, boys clubs, mm -hmm. have to step up and start talking about these things because they're not coming to us with those skills. They're coming to us without an example of how do you behave, how do you self-regulate, how do you work with when you're frustrated because these kids are frustrated. You think about their whole world uh, is revolves around whatever is happening in that home and when there's not being, meals not being uh, cooked, uh, their needs are not being met, they're kind of raising themselves. They, not only is there a, a frustration and anger, but there's a, a, this issue of, I don't know what to do. I don't yeah. have an, even an example of what this is supposed to look like. And so I think society has to step up and, and help our kids get there. Wow. Guys, this is the superintendent of schools in Cabell County working towards making the kids' lives better. And I, it, it touches me in my heart to know that, that someone that, that's in control of trying to help the kids is really going and putting forth the effort that you are. I wish that everybody in our wonderful country would think and feel the same yeah. way. I appreciate you. Yeah. Well, we can't get discouraged because you know, uh, and I tell the staff all the time, you, you, you try, you want to, to help every kid, but you can't save them all. And so we have to think about what do we, and this is an example, we can stand at the bottom of a waterfall and watch them fall over and, and not do anything. But if we go up above there and figure out what's causing them to come to the waterfall and fall over, we'll have more impact. And so, you know, just to be in the mode of, of a crisis management is not enough. You have to really be more proactive, figuring out why this is happening and then and addressing it from that point of view. So when you think about the homes they come in, that's talking about why it's happening mm -hmm. and the opioid epidemic of how to, to get that eradicated. It's going to save more kids than if we just try to help them when they fall over the edge. Man, try to catch them before they get to that point. Yeah. All right, I appreciate your time, guys. And stay tuned. With the Challenge for Change tour, we got more coming. Hey guys, uh, welcome back. We're still here in Huntington, West Virginia. We're at the Cabell Huntington Health Department. We're sitting here with two nice young gentlemen, um, Tim Hazlett and uh, Dr. Michael Kilkenny. Did I say that right? Mm -hmm. Appreciate you guys giving a um, little bit of your time. I know you're busy, gentlemen. Um, we're traveling, we're doing a tour on Relate with Nate, uh, and we're stopping in different cities, different towns, and we're talking about substance abuse, maybe find different or alternative ways to battle it as a country instead of, uh, you know, sitting back and taking what what and how it's done to our people. So uh, first of all, I want to ask you guys, how much have you seen the abuse change within the last 10 years? In a 10 year period, it shifted quite a bit in this area. It shifted uh, some parts of West Virginia are still dominated by pills, but this part, uh, the pills, is reduced and uh, have been replaced with heroin. And then the heroin was replaced with more potent um, drugs like fentanyl and fentanyl analogs. Yeah, one, one of the biggest things you see is, as a city, the issues with drugs were often isolated in specific communities where now we've seen that shift to where it's basically overtaking the whole city. So when we look at police department data that shows crime statistics, it was isolated into very small geographic areas where now when you look at that crime, drug offense across the city, it's basically from one end to the other. So uh, what do you think caused the change between the pills and the heroin? It's controversial to uh, say and it's not uh, I, I don't know that it's completely um, validated but what well, our perception here is that uh, pills were rampant they were widely prescribed it was generally considered that pain was something nobody should have and uh, uh, that's not even a possible uh, outcome for pain treatment but um, doctors were prescribing very widely in the 90s and uh, 
we began to see problems with abuse of pills, uh, but uh, they were being diverted and uh, misused and abused, and we started to see over overdose deaths related to that and other problems related to that. Um, so the doctors began re prescribing more responsibly. Uh, when the responsible prescribing came about, the pills were harder to get. Uh, what we saw in southern West Virginia was that there were a few pill mills, um, but those got closed down and you had to go to Florida mm -hmm. to the pill mill to get your pills and buy pills wholesale. Um, when the Florida mills closed down, pills became very expensive on the mm -hmm. street and heroin was then cheaper. So the shift went to heroin. Um, like I said, I'm from Wins and, and you know, we had a big pill mill there, they closed down. It's still, we're just in the process now where, where the pills are moving out and it's becoming more heroin. And like you said, that fentanyl, man, that stuff is, is deadly. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, a little small amount and you're out of here, right? That stuff. And we've been, uh, we've had fentanyl in the drug supply for years, uh, but it became more prominent more recently, and then the analogs of fentanyl that are even more potent than fentanyl, the carfentanyl and the other uh, fentanyls, uh, they hit town here last summer, and the death rate went up from there. And we've, at the Cabo Huntington Health Department, we have a harm reduction program, and we've been doing ex syringe exchange for about a year and a half. Uh, we've been doing a uh, naloxone distribution program for a little over a year, and we've had about a thousand reversals of, uh, by that I mean a thousand overdoses have been reversed by naloxone that we've distributed from here. And despite that, the death rate is still going up because the drugs are more potent than ever and uh, and we don't have a handle on on stopping the use. One of the issues you see with us is you go back into the 90s and come forward into 2000 and even up to 2008 and 9 is the understanding of the depth and breadth of the problem in the city. So while he said there was a lot of pills being distributed from pill mills as well as other agencies or other physicians, those were in the community but until we started seeing the death come about, we really didn't have an understanding or were we even remotely educated on the problem. So from our perspective here, we know more about the problem today than we did back then. So what happened is when you shut the pill mills down, you didn't have a transfer of what are you gonna do with those patients. So you didn't have the treatment, you didn't have the systems, you didn't have the facilities set up to handle those patients who were either dependent or addicted and now you have all those individuals with no place to get what they need. So they then transferred and cost was the biggest driver. When heroin, the cost of heroin was very, very low, these people shifted. But today, our education and our knowledge of the problem is not where we want it to be, but it's far, far more advanced in the last year than it was as little as two years ago. So understanding the problem is the key to fixing it, and that's one of the things, as Dr. Kilkenny shared, we have started the harm reduction program, but we spent six months edu educating ourselves on the problem and the issues and what we're going to see, and then started our harm reduction program behind that as part of the overall solution. That's not the solution, that is a piece of the solution. So what is what is the program consist of, the uh, harm reduction? The harm reduction, does a lot of education. We educate about the dangers of drug use. We educate on uh, the complications from injection drug use in particular. Uh, we educate in safer uh, alternatives to that. And uh, we educate about recovery. We do testing. If someone comes in, uh, we can test them for hepatitis C or for HIV or hepatitis B. Those are the three particular concerns, especially hepatitis C and HIV. 
that are uh, our greatest concern in dealing with uh, injection drug users. We can vaccinate them if they're not immune to hepatitis B. There's a vaccine for that. We can treat them for skin abscesses and other kinds of problems along those lines if they have a sexually transmitted disease along with their substance use, we can treat that. And uh, finally, we can refer them. If they, have, if they end up having HIV or hepatitis C, we can refer them to the specialist that can treat those things. Or if they want recovery, we can refer them to the mental health facilities or the recovery center that they need to take care of those problems. So it's uh, really all of those things combined in harm reduction. Plus, we do the naloxone distribution program in West Virginia. There's a Good Samaritan law. It is legal for people to carry and administer naloxone. Uh, it is also legal for pharmacists to dispense naloxone without a prescription by giving a short educational program on how to use it. Uh, so getting the naloxone in the hands of the users and the families and friends of the mm -hmm. users uh, puts naloxone in the house uh, in case there is an overdose and maybe give that person another chance. Today they might not be ready, tomorrow they're ready they have to live till tomorrow. Absolutely. So we have that uh, going on and although it draws the most attention, it's not the biggest part of our program. That's the syringe exchange. We do provide sterile equipment for people to inject with. Uh, it is A lot of people are against that, but I, I'm, I'm like you. I mean, if they're going to use it, we'd rather be clean because like you said, even though they're not ready today, tomorrow they they will be. Uh, our goal is that they go into recovery disease-free and of course they have to be alive. Mm -hmm. So if you die, we've missed that opportunity. Uh, to go into your clean life with a disease like hepatitis C or HIV, it's an extra challenge for you. It makes it more difficult. There's no reason for people to have to suffer from those diseases. and. A lot of people do go into recovery. And on the other side, let's be disease free. So, as well as Nate, one thing to add on that if you go back and look in the West Virginia State Code in Chapter 16, as a public health agency, our response, we are responsible for communicable disease prevention and control. As Dr. Kilkenny mentioned, hepatitis C, uh, hepatitis B, HIV. Those are diseases that we have responsibility of controlling. So we look at this from a health aspect that providing these clean syringes will certainly have an impact on HIV, which we want to ensure that we don't have an outbreak similar to Scott County, Indiana uh, with the HIV, but it also will impact uh, Hep C and Hep B as well. well Y'all offer a lot of programs and a lot of helpful people. Um, how can someone be in contact or how can someone that needs help, you know, um, become part of your program? Well, for uh, folks in our service area, we are we run the syringe exchange program from 10 to 3 on Wednesdays uh, here at the health department. So they can just drop in. We have recovery coaches on site. They'll be greeted when they come in. Um, our pharmacist is down there dispensing naloxone right now. Uh, we can take care of virtually all their initial needs in one visit and all they have to do is come by. Come on.